Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. If you haven't heard it out, there was a theme between all these songs. Amen. Thank you very much for the song selection, even the old ones. Yes. <laughs> Amen. So let's see here, but it says, well, that was way too old. That was even before my time. <laughs> I remember when some of those songs were the top of the song, yeah. and those were the shouting songs. Yeah. Amen. 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 We got to shout for the victory, which still isn't the newest, newest song, but yeah. my goodness. Yeah. But one thing I realized is the theme in most of these songs was uh, how we perceive our situation. Because we talked about shout for victory in this last song. But there might be something here that say, I don't even feel that victorious. But the reason why we shout isn't because we are victorious, but because we know victory is coming down the road. I may not be in victory right now, but there is going to be victory coming. Why? Because the word of the Lord promises it to us. Amen. Amen. So we don't speak in what's happening in the present tense. We speak of what may be coming down the road later. Amen. And we have the right to do that. Because of our relationship with God, we know that there is going to be victory on the horizon. If I'm not in it now, I will be at some point. Hallelujah. So I can shout now for the victory to come. Amen. Amen. Too many times we wait for our, our um, present situation to align ourselves with what we sing. I can't really shout for the victory because I'm not experiencing victory right now. Uh-huh. And lo and behold, that is exactly what I'm going to be speaking about tonight. So thank you. Sometimes I go in wondering, I hope you know, it's, it's two weeks removed. I've been working on this sermon. Jesus, Jesus. And I thought last week was the day, but tonight obviously is the night. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus. Amen. Give your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 18, a very familiar scripture. I've preached from it, I've read it, I've used it, I've quoted it, and I realized a couple things that even tonight in some one of the songs, that's number three, actually enlightened me to this verse more than what I understood before. Amen. Proverbs chapter 18, verse... 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Let me say that again. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Amen. Amen. I'm going to stop right there. You can shut it all down. Tonight I'm going to speak for a little bit on speak of the glory. Amen. Amen. Speak Amen. of the glory. Dear Lord, I love you, Lord. I appreciate you. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you, Lord, for your for your confirmation voice in this place tonight. I know, Lord, beyond the shadow of a doubt that, that what is happening here tonight is orchestrated of you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you speak down into this place, Lord. Help us, Lord, to understand and receive. Open us up to what you're trying to get us to understand. Open us up to what you're trying to get us to, to know, Lord, and, and to learn of you, I pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I love you, Lord. I worship you. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Uh, so many times, how many times have we quoted this verse and we've always quoted it, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Amen. Right? Read it. Why is that? Because our life with before Jesus was death. Right. 
So it is saying at one point in our life, all we could speak was death. Right. Right. Amen. Even, even, even because we were dead in our trespasses in sin, and no matter how hard we tried to be positive, Amen. nothing but death came out of our mouths. Right. Amen. Uh-huh. That's why it says now all of a sudden you're experiencing a new situation in your in your in your position and it's called now life. Right. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so when we speak with life in our mouth. Because we are alive. Amen. Through the power of the Holy Ghost Amen. that's in our life, yes. we have now became alive. Amen. 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 So now our speech needs to change. Yes. Amen. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so we have the ability now because we understand the difference between right and wrong. Life and death. Right. Uh -huh. And we now have the ability through the power of the tongue to not only project into situations either or, right. but also, if we're not careful, our speech right. can revert us back. Right. Amen. Our speech now should not right. be reminiscent of our dead past. Right. Amen. Uh huh. Amen. We're talking about react actions and reactions. We need to have an attitude. That if something in our life isn't happening, we have the ability through our actions to bring yes. it about. Yes. Amen. We sang about victory tonight. Well, if you're not experiencing victory, you're like, I'm sorry, we need to pray for you and with you. But I'm trying to get us to understand if you're not experiencing victory right now, right. there is a way to achieve victory, and that is to act as if you are in victory. Because why? Because I'm trying to get us to realize that our actions project our outcome. Amen. If we want to act as a dead person, we'll become a dead person. Right. If we want to act like a loser, we will become a loser. Right. If we want to act like a complainer, we'll become a complainer. Right. If we want to act like the world will become like the world. Right. Amen. Why? Because we have that power. Amen. That's part of what Jesus was saying when he told his disciples in Acts 1 and 8, ye shall receive power. Power, yes. Amen. It's part of that power. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <clears throat> We can read many times throughout the New Testament through Jesus' ministry. Jesus did a lot of miracles, signs. Of, Jesus healed and changed a lot of lives. But he only changed the lives of those who wanted their lives changed. Right. There were people that were around Jesus that followed him wherever he went just to see what he was going to do. And they waited and they watched for him to make a mistake and all they ever saw of his actions was not the miracles, uh -huh. but they saw the mistakes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. it's true. So what was a miracle to one was a mistake to another. Yeah. And it all boiled down to those person's perception of what was going on. Mm -hmm. Sadducees and Pharisees followed him around waiting for him to make a mistake. Yeah. And every time he did anything, they were looking for a reason 
to discredit him. Not one time they ever come up to and say, man, you just blew my doors off. Man, I can't believe what you just did. I come here to see something different, but my word, you changed my viewpoint. What I'm trying to just understand is no matter what's going on around us, God can change one person's life and we can be witness to it, but our understanding of viewpoint of it could be good or bad. We will see what we want to see. Same way with the Lord working in our lives. We can look for the good things or we can focus on the bad things. Right. Amen. And we can come to the conclusion, God never does anything for me. If you ever speak those words, I want to tell you right now, tonight, that's exactly what will happen in your life. God will never do anything for you. Right. You just spoke death into your life. How many times have I heard people say, well, I just, I don't feel God. I don't know where he is. He, he hasn't been around. I, 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 I haven't sensed him. I, really, I know what they're trying to say, but they need to be careful how they speak and how they voice it. Because the word of God says even nature speaks of his existence. Right. So if you can't find God in your own life, just look around you, honey. You'll find you. Because he's even in nature. He's out there. So just because you can't see him in your own life, don't you dare speak it because that's exactly what will happen. You won't see him even in nature. You won't see him even in the goodness that he does for others. You won't see him when you're standing in his presence in the middle of a church service, you won't see them. Why? Because you're not. You, you think you're looking for them, but you're expecting them not to show up with your words and with your lack of anticipation. And it says, and they that love it. Not just, we read this, Love it could refer to death or life. There are people that are eternally negative all the time. I feel sorry for them. Even people who have been in the church their whole lives, I've seen them negative all the time. You want to know what? If you put your focus on man, you will be disappointed every time. That's right. And sometimes when I when I see negativity come from people, I realize that that is the difference. They're so busy looking at their fellow brothers and sisters that they can't even see God. That's right. And if you constantly focus on your brothers and sisters, you're going to. There's going to be negative all the time. Why? Because we're human. We fail. Even in our attempts to do good sometimes, we make mistakes. I'm not going to say I'm above making a mistake. Amen. But if I constantly watch for people and just expect people to fail and to fail me, that's exactly what's going to happen. And then what the enemy says is, ha, if I didn't get them to look at man and concentrate on man, then they won't see God for the forest and the, for the trees in the forest. Right. Uh-huh. It's sad. <coughs> And our point this year is to make sure that, that our speech and our actions reflect what we want the outcome to be. Yes. This is the one and only area where we can affect the outcome. Uh-huh. We'd rather, I want, 
The church today needs to be an outcome-based church. Yes, amen. We don't react to what's going on in our lives immediately. We act based on what the outcome is that we want. Amen. Right. Amen. And it says, of the t and they love it. And they that love it, whatever speech it may be, you're going to eat the fruit thereof. If all you speak is death, that's all the fruit you're going to eat is death. Mm. If you speak of life, all the fruit you're going to eat is life. <laughs> Need to be careful. I, I, there, there's way too much negativity. I sense it in our attitudes sometimes, in our language, in our postures, in our actions and reactions. We wait for God to move us before we move. Right. I'm going to dance like the war is over. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Victory is mine before I before my, my can see it. See it. before my eyes can see it. Yeah. Once again, thank you for those songs. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they spoke of what God is trying to get us to understand here tonight. Amen. Amen. Mark eleven twenty three. Another very familiar scripture that I've read and quoted and said many times. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. There are two things. First we have to say it. Amen. Then we have to have no doubt. Right. And it has to be in our heart, not in our mind. Yeah. We have to believe it. Not just up here, but here. Right. Amen. Amen but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. Yes. Too many times we want our mountains to be removed immediately. Right. Sometimes it doesn't always happen immediately. How we go from that point determines the moving of that mountain. What am I to say? If we put it in the hands of the Lord to move that mountain, then we need to live our life as if it's been moved. Amen. We don't wait for it to move before we change how we live. We don't wait till the victory has come before we live victoriously. Because if we do wait, that time will never come. What he's saying is if you pray that the mountain be removed, then you need to live it and believe it that it's been moved. Amen. Even if it's not been moved immediately, we know that we left it in the hands of the Lord and it's going to be moved and I need to live and move on from this point as if the mountain has moved. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And if we do that, it will come to pass. Uh-huh. Yes. And it says, and he shall have whatsoever he saith. Yes. It goes back to death and life. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, shall have whatsoever he saith. Mm -hmm. If you can only speak death, that's all you're going to get. If you can only speak negativity, that's all you're going to get. If you can only be negative, that's all you're ever going to see. Right. It, it, you're going to be bombarded with it. You're going to be inundated with it. You're going to, it's going to smash against you like a, an ocean wave. Negative, 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 negative. And I know apostolics that are constantly 
They can do nothing but speak negative. Now we always have this belief that if we're having a miserable day and we tell people that, that we're good, then we're lying. We, we, we say, well, I need to be truthful and tell people that I'm, being, I'm having a miserable day. Right. No, no, no. We need to realize something, even though today I may be miserable. Yeah. My speech can't be speaking right. of what I'm experiencing right now. Right. Amen. Amen. I need to speak as yeah. if the victory's yeah. already been won. Yeah. I need to speak as if the mountain's yeah. already been won. Yeah. I need to speak. So if I tell people I am good, it may not be because I'm not I'm good right now, but I know that through the power of God, it's going to be a good day at some point or another. I'm speaking of things to come. Amen. Hallelujah. So don't get offended if somebody asks you how you're doing and, and you know you're not feeling well. You know, but, but you come to church and you pray that God will heal your body. What do you think you're going to supposed to do when people ask you how you're feeling? Well, I'm not feeling really good right now. No, you, you know within your mind, you prayed. Yes. You gave it over to God. Yes. God's got it in his hand. Yes. And guess what? I'm healed. Hallelujah. I'm feeling good. Yes. I'm feeling fine. Yes. You're not lying. You're speaking of good to come. Amen. Yes. Amen. But, like I said, you're one of those people that always see the negative, then by all means, share everything negative that's going on in your life. And then try to get those people to come to church with you. Wow, why should I go to your church? I'd be miserable in my own church. Hello? Am I speaking truth or what? Amen. My hair is still isn't completely back. So you guys, you got to speak up if you want me to hear you or I'm just going to keep repeating myself. Wow. Oh, Pastor just said something negative. We need to watch what we say because we can, if we're not careful, We can speak life or death to our mountain. If we can't ever be positive about what's going on in our lives, our mountain is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger because it grows on negativity. Guess what? You know what? Maybe we haven't figured this out right now. But mountains in their lives represent negative, negativity. They're not a positive thing. They're not a positive thing. Mountains speak of negative things. And the Bible says, if you want your negative to be gone, you need to change how you speak of it. Because if you speak of it, oh, there's power in this, folks. We need to realize something. We grow our own mountains based on what we say and how we perceive it. Right. Right. I know people that live their lives in a constant uphill battle. Why? Because they're always speaking of the mountains in their lives. The obstacles they have to face. The struggles they're dealing with. The attitudes that, that, that are around them.
Amen. You know what I, I've discovered? I've discovered something about, about mountains. From ground level, mountains look huge. I, I, I remember as a child many times, I, I, I actually think mountains are beautiful. The actual physical mountains. Like the Rocky Mountain Range is absolutely gorgeous. Okay? And as you are driving through Wyoming or Montana, when you crest, you can see the mountains from a long ways away. And they look so distant. Right. But all of a sudden you get closer and closer and closer, and the closer you get to it, the bigger they get. Yeah. They look huge. They're humongous. But you take that same trip at 35 to 40,000 feet in the air. Right. You look down on the mountains, they look so small. Right. Uh huh. If you want to live your life on the valley floor, your mountains are going to look huge. But your elevation determines your perception of your mountain. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. Oh, if you are facing a mountain in your life, we want it. I want it. Let's put it in perspective. Am I facing a mountain from ground level or am I facing a mountain from 35,000 feet? Right. The same mountain range that looks so ominous and so large from down here. From up here yeah. and your elevation, it's the same mountains, but they look so small. How do you perceive it? If you see your mountain from up here, it doesn't seem to be that big. When you're constantly looking at your mountain from the valley floor, those exact same mountains. So your elevation determines your perception of your mountain. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Uh-huh. Hallelujah. 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 When my kids were little, We took them to Disney World, and we took the girls in a, I don't know what they would call it, it wasn't a movie plex, but whatever it was, it was a experience, more than a movie plex, but it was, honey, we shrunk the audience, and it was a 3D movie from this tall. So, you'd be surprised how big an ant looks when you're smaller than the ant. Right. <laughs> so you're watching this thing through 3D glasses and, and the ants and the mice and everything are like alive and they're all coming at you and you, you're this tall. You're smaller than the ants. You can walk under their belly, and they look so huge. But we look at an ant now from this height, and we look at, oh, that's a pretty small thing. Mm -hmm. But if we're not careful, our words can take that little ant and make it bigger than us. Right. Yeah. We have the ability, our words has the ability to make our mountain into whatever we want it to be. We can give 
life or death. It depends on how we speak of our mountains. Am I telling us we're not going to have mountains in our lives? No, that's not what I'm saying. Am I not saying we're, am I saying we're not going to face, to, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm trying to get us to understand is we need to change how we perceive what we're going through. Yes. Because as a child of God, there is no mountain big enough. There is no ocean wide enough. That's right. There is no valley deep enough. I know I just quoted a 1950s or 40s song. <laughs> all the all the all the children. He, he he just quoted a song. The truth is still the truth. Mm-hmm. Job 27 and 4 says this: My lips shall not speak wickedness. nor my tongue utter deceit. Oh, the Lord's cheated me. I feel cheated. I feel left out. I feel like I've been failed. Let me change our language. It's not God who fails us. It's we who fail God. God doesn't have to. If you, if we are waiting for God to prove himself to us, it will never happen. Because no matter what he does or doesn't do, God is still God. His actions doesn't make him God. Mm -hmm. How he lives through our lives doesn't make him God. God is the I am. Meaning there's no one before me, there's no one after me, there's no one greater than me, there is no one. I am the top dog. There is nothing out there greater than me. With me, uh, there is no limits. Oh. The I am is limitless. The only limits placed on God are ones we place. Right. Amen. Amen. So be careful. Speaking of my misery is not giving glory to God. I, I need to be truthful and honest. Just turn it over to the Lord. Yes, then leave it in His hand. Don't take back possession of it. Mm. If you left it with God, then leave it with God. The moment you open your mouth and speak of it again, you're taking back possession of it. Uh huh. If you left it with God, then leave it in His hand and move on. Us and we'll say, oh yeah, okay. 
Numbers 13. Moses sent them to spy. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein. This is where he made a mistake. If his idea and his intentions were to possess the promised land, then why did he commission them to look at to inherit in those that are holding? whether they be strong or weak. Right. Oh, let me tell you something. It doesn't matter how they perceive themselves. They may look at all their armament and think that they are stronger than whoever else lives in the land. They may be top dog in the land, but they haven't come across or against God, who is the mightiest of mighties. There is nobody stronger than God. It doesn't matter how strong or how weak the inhabitants are of your promise. God is always stronger. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Think about that. It doesn't matter how they perceived the inhabitants. It doesn't matter how you perceive those that inhabit your promise. Right, right. You, we need to realize that God is bigger. Yes. They haven't come across anything like God before. Right. They put their faith in horses and chariots. But I will remember the name of the Lord thy God. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. They put faith in their armor and their shields and their swords. Right. And we all know from the experience of Jericho, you don't need any of that as long as God's on your side. Right. It doesn't matter what the inhabitants have in their possession. Right. God is bigger. Amen. Yes. It doesn't matter how big your mountain is. God is bigger. Amen. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with. God is bigger. And he went on. The people that dwell there, whether they be strong or weak, whether they be few or many, doesn't matter. Amen. Many as in what? What was his measuring stick? Uh -huh. What was his measuring stick? He wasn't telling his spies to measure the inhabitants against God. Right. He was telling them to measure the inhabitants against us. Right. Right. Oh, church. Are they stronger than us or are they weaker than us? Right. Are they more than us or are they less than us? Right. Yeah. You see, that's what he was saying. He was using the children of Israel as a measuring stick. Right. Amen. But if I were to stop right there and just jump ahead, there's a two people. Joshua and Caleb, who did use the children of Israel as the measuring stick. That's right. Because when they said they are, we are well able. Why? Not because the unsurmountable odds are in our favor. We have God on our side, and they don't. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 
Oh, but that's not the worst of it yet. Few or many. What the land is that they dwell in, whether it be a good land or a bad land, based on what? Based on the wilderness that they're in right now? Right. See, what am I trying to get us to understand here tonight? We always measure our situation based on what's going on around us. Right. And based on, we, we evaluate our um, position against the enemy's position. If we are spiritually weak, then of course the enemy's going to seem stronger than us. If we are incapable of seeing a positive, then the mountains are always going to be bigger. Hmm. Then look at the land, whether it be good or bad, and what the cities they be that they dwell in. Are they in tents or in strongholds? Mm -hmm. huh. Well, we're in tents because we're nomad people. Right. If they're brick and mortar buildings and walls and cities, people of tents can't compete against that. Well, based on those standards, we don't stand a chance. Why is it that God is not the deciding factor of our decisions? Our immediate position is the deciding factor. What am I trying to get us to understand? We worship when we feel good about ourselves. We don't worship when we feel bad. We, we, we give God all the glory when things are going good, but when things are going bad, we don't. We, our, our, our relationship and how we exalt the Lord God Almighty is solely based on our position uh, at that time. If you knew what I was going through, you'd understand why I don't worship and praise God. Your situation doesn't change God. Right, right. All it does is change your viewpoint of God. Right. Why? Because you're looking at God through the prism of your position. We're looking at God through the prism of our position. So, what, what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage. <laughs> then he tells them, be of good courage. There, there, there's a good word of, of encouragement right there. Be of good courage. And bring of the fruit of the land. Because now the time was the time of the first striped grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rio, as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before someone in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Eshcol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two. Wow. I, I saw an, uh, an etching of that picture. It's actually kind of, we had an old family Bible that sat on our, and they had some cool etchings and cool pictographs in there of, of certain things. And one of the pictures was men carrying a huge cluster of grapes on a stick. I always thought that was fascinating. I'm like, grapes that big? 
how could you not want to say? One thing we got to ask ourselves, does the fruit of the promise outweigh the wars, the struggles, and the battles we may have to fight face in order to possess them? How big would the grapes have to be, Sister Charity, before you change your mind? We'd have to take four men to carry them before they would say, you know what? I don't care what the inhabitants of this land look like. With grapes that big, my goodness. Right? What well, what's the limit? And you all know, we all know we got limits. How big is our God? How much does he have to show his hand? How, how great does he have to be in our life before uh, his greatness outweighs how we perceive our situation? Uh-huh. Well, if somebody asks you, you know what, I, I, I don't really know about God and his uh, ability to, but if somebody would actually come in on a wheelchair, and I know that they can't walk. They've never walked in their life. If they were to ever walk out, then I know for certain I will serve God for the rest of my life. We shake our heads. People have actually think that. I find it hard to believe that God has to prove himself to us before we mm -hmm. Okay. So let's go on, because I, I don't want to spend here. And, and place was called the brook Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from, from thence. And they returned fro, fro by searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them. And unto all the congregation and they showed them the fruit of the land. Stop right there. So picture this. They come marching in a distance. And they said, that may be after 40 days. That may be our men that we sent out. What is that they're carrying between them? My goodness gracious. Look at that cluster of grapes. Oh my word. Let's go. Amen. You mean to tell me you found those there? Oh, yeah, we found them there. Let's go. You mean to tell me that's, that, that, that's the kind of grapes that that land that the promise produces? Yeah, let's go. Oh, the church, the congregation gets excited right. when people walk in through the doors and they have nothing but positive reports. And we, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. We'll give them our dollars. We'll give them our bucks. We'll give them this. We'll give them that, but all of a sudden they leave and we realize reality sets in and they say, but I'm glad it's happening over there, but it's not happening like that here. Oh, how I wish it would happen here. Well, It's easy for them to have that kind of faith because they live in it. They live in it because they anticipate it. Mm -hmm. They right. speak of it. Yes. They live it. They don't go there saying, I'm trying to build a church of 20. They go there saying, I'm trying to reach a nation. Uh, Amen. Amen. Oh. Is that them? And they brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them and said, We came unto the land whether thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. You were lying. God was a lion. It flows with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. And then it has that word. Nevertheless. 
Reality check. This is where we live. This is our bread and buddy butter right here. We live at that conjunction. God is great, but right. I'm not feeling well, but I had a terrible day, but it, it was miserable today, but the weather was just rotten. I feel so down, but that's where we live. Mm -hmm. That conjunction. Okay. If we're not careful, mm -hmm. that conjunction will determine what side we land on. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you something. We need to be careful. Because they're, we say, well, they're giving the complete picture. They're giving the picture to Moses to ask for. But we got to realize something. Moses was anticipating them coming back with a negative report. Mm -hmm. So he thought that they would come back with peaches and cream. Right. He had no thought that they would come back with a negative report. And when they come back to reality and they say, but nevertheless. Mm -hmm. And this is what we got to be careful. And the reason why I'm speaking this tonight is this. If we're not careful, our words has a way of swaying the direction of the whole congregation. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Oh, we may, you might be in misery, but misery loves company. And we always like to feel better about our misery if somebody else is going through it with us. Well, excuse me. You may have just swayed the congregation into the nevertheless. Nevertheless, now this is our real report. The people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities, they don't live in tents, they're walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the Jura of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. Not only do we have mountains to face, we also have Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites. And then the Canaanites, they dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb, good old Caleb, yeah. stood, still the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once. Yes. Let's not give them a chance. Yes. Let's surprise them. Yes. Let's go in there. Yes. Let's not delay. Yes. Those grapes are only going to stay ripe on the vine so long. We need to get there before they spoil Let's go up at once and possess it. Now, that word possess means that all they have to do is show up. Why? 
Because the Lord told Moses, I went before you. I fought the battles. All you need to do is go in and take possession of it. Meaning, if I were to put something between I and Sister Charity, the person who gets it first and they have possession of it. What does that mean? That means the, the people who it, the inhabitants of the land or the inhabitants of the promise do not possess it. Uh -huh. The giants and the walled cities and everything else does not mark possession. It just proves that they inhabit. They live there, but they don't possess it. Because they can't possess something that doesn't belong to them. So, right? The promises of God cannot be possessed by your enemies, yeah. by your situation, by your mountains, by the giants, by the walled cities. They do not possess your promise. They just inhabit there. But if you want to take possession of it, you need to just go in and show up. Rahab herself said, what took you so long? We saw you and we anticipated you coming in here and we sat here and waited for your attack for 40 years. <laughs> for 40 years. Because when the inhabitants of the promise got a look at the army and the people of God, they knew that their time was up. The only ones who did not know that their time was that their time for action was then for the children of Israel. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people. They are stronger than we. Yeah, they are. But they're not stronger than God. Amen. They brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, if I were to take this land and compare it to us, yeah, they may look stronger than us, but if I were to compare them against our God, they're nothing. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. There we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in, not in their sight, but in our own sight. As grasshoppers. We saw the giants. And they didn't speak to us and say, you're nothing but a grasshopper to us. We saw that we, in our own sights, were grasshoppers. Hmm. I should have, I should have, oh, that was a great title. I need to change the title. The Vision of Grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. And then jumping to Numbers 14. Starting in verse 1. All the congregation. This is where I said we need to be careful with what we say. Mm -hmm. Because we are swaying the whole congregation. Mm -hmm.
And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the change of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God. that we had died in the land of Egypt. Oh, with God, we had died in this wilderness. Wherefore hath the Lord brought us onto this land to fall by sword? And our wives and our children should be a prey. Oh, They had even, the congregation haven't even seen the promised land. They based their whole whining and complaining. And they were, they were ready. They should have just died in Egypt. Based on the words of ten men. Who had a small viewpoint of the congregation and they had a large viewpoint of the inhabitants. Mm -hmm. Oh. Right. Let me point something out. Ten men yes. swayed the viewpoint of millions. Uh -huh. Right. Uh huh. So don't tell me that one person in a congregation of 20 could not come in here and with the right words sway the 20. Right. 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 If 10 can sway a million, yeah. then one person can sway 20 yeah. easily. Because misery loves company. Yeah. Oh, and I thought I was the only one that felt that way. Oh, I'm so glad to know that there's other people that are upset with the pastor just like I am. Oh, it's so good to know that I'm not by myself, that I must not be crazy if everybody else thinks this way. Jesus, that I'm not wrong in my thinking. He says, I found agreement. It's not wrong thinking. It's dirty thinking. It's stinking thinking. Mm. I don't know why I brought that up. Not referring to anything in particular, but the shoe fits. Where? Yeah. Because usually when there's negativity going on about the pastor, the pastor's the last one to find out. Because the one person that they should be getting the answers from, or not the one person that they're coming to to get the answers, they go to everybody else. And then the pastor's like, what's going on? It's all of this. Oh, don't you know? And all of a sudden, we don't speak of ourselves as being, I, there's something that you said that offended me. There's more than, that you offend a lot of people. Oh. Why? Because you've already taken the, taken the poll. Uh-huh, yeah, you have. And I, I, I'm amazed how you talk to two people and then two people just all of a sudden represent all the people. Uh 
Uh huh. Why do you think churches split and divide? It all starts with one person who has a who has a bitterness in them, and they start talking, and they'll talk, and they will listen, and then all of a sudden they start to gravitate to people who have the exact same thinking, and then they start aligning their thinking, and then they assume because two people have the same aligned thinking that it must be everybody. Guess what? The words of ten swayed a congregation of millions. And the two people that were on the side of God, and you notice Moses kept quiet in all of this. Moses went along with the majority. He didn't say, I don't care what you people say. I've talked I'm the one who talked to God. And God told me that all we have to do is go in and possess it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter who lives there. We're going. All right. Go on, get you done. It doesn't matter how big the, the cities are. We're going. Right. It doesn't matter how big the strongholds are. We're going to break through them. We're going. Because my God is bigger than anything that the inhabitants can throw at us. We're going to try to get to understand. The city that our church resides in is our possession. They just inhabit it. We can't be slinking around like we're spies looking for opportunities. We need to not just take opportunities that are presented to us, but we need to create opportunities and say, guess what? Amen. You guys are just here by our, you guys inhabit our promise. Right. right. Yeah. And when the, every church starts seeing their cities as their possession. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's great. Amen. That's great. Mm. Revival. Hallelujah. It's just a natural outcome. Amen. Revival isn't based upon what songs we sing, right. how many people run the aisle, right. how many people get the Holy Ghost. Revival is based on our viewpoint of our situation. If we are in revival, then we need to act and speak as if we're in revival. Amen. If you want revival, you speak as if you are in or are experiencing revival. Amen. You don't speak of it as it's something down the road, right. waiting, just hoping that I can take possess. No, the word of God says if the victory's already won. Revival's already at hand. All you have to do is reach out and take possession of it and claim it for yourself. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Now, after all of this, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel, and Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which you pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. Not and then they said, if the Lord delight in us. That word if. 
It's a very popular word. If I were to go into Strong's Concordance and type in the word if, to see how many times it's in the Bible. <laughs> we need to be careful if that word if is in our vocabulary when we say, the Lord will heal me if uh -huh. yeah. he sees fit. Right. If the Lord delight in us, the Lord already told Moses. Yes. Then he will bring us into this land, oh, and give it us. He already gave it to them. The Lord told Moses, hey, I've already fought the battles. I've already fought the wars. All you have to do is go in and take possession of it. But for some reason, Moses <laughs> didn't share that part of the conversation with the congregation. Right. Right. Amen. Why? Because even the man of God bought in to their negativity. Right. The word if is the word that says this is the direction God put us in if well when it comes to revival and it comes to saving the lost there is no if he will give it us, a land which floweth milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not, with all the congregation already made up their mind. And said, anybody who tries to force us to go do something we don't want to do, we're going to crucify them. And then what did they do? They murmured against him by bringing up a slander upon the land. Even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephthah, which were of the men, they went to search the land. They lived still. Is there hope, even though in an unsurmounting negativity, to survive? Yeah. If you hold true, you can live. Amen. And I want to close with this. Psalms 145. Verse 11 and verse 21. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. My mouth shall speak the praises of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen. Let me say that again. They shall speak of the glory of the kingdom. Our Words need to speak of the glory of the kingdom. Yes. Amen. Our words need to speak of his power. Our words need to speak of the praise. Yes. Amen. Amen. And when we do that, our flesh will follow. Yes. Talk about putting your flesh in subjection. Right. Oh, uh, we need to be understand this. It is our words that puts our flesh 
in subjection. If we do nothing but sing of the glory of the kingdom and of the power and of the praises of the Lord, our flesh will follow. Man, I see people's flesh heading down the wrong direction. I know what their mouth is saying. Because your flesh, our flesh, will reflect our words. Right. Yeah. It is not so much our language when we're within these four walls. It's more about our language when we're out there yeah. among the inhabitants yeah. of our possession. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know what our language is like based upon how big of the mountains you have in your life you're trying to scale. Because what we have done with our words, rather than tearing down mountains, we have put rocks back on them. We have built them up. We have made them bigger than our God. And then I know with the surety that we're not speaking of his glory. And we're not speaking of his power. And we don't have praises on our lips. I know that we're being led by negative words and thoughts. Let's ignore what I know. Agent. God knows. We will see God's glory if all we ever do is speak of God's glory. Mm -hmm. We will see God's presence if all we ever do is speak of God's oh, presence. Hallelujah. We will see the praises and experience the, the heavenly experience of praises of God if all we, if we speak the praises. If we see the power of God, we will only see it because we speak of the power of God. Amen. Amen. We have the ability in our mouth to speak what we want. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Be careful. Because one negative word, oh, as true as it may be, we don't speak of the immediate. Our vision has to go beyond the immediate. It has to see to the future. And I know, based on the word of God, that even though our immediate looks bleak, I know the future. And I know the end results. Oh, and if I were to just keep myself in the right straight and narrow, I will see oh, those things Jesus. come to pass. So I can speak as God does, as if they've already came to pass. Yes. That's the authority we have through the power of the Holy Ghost to speak as if they have already come to pass. Amen. Hello. What do you want to, what do you want to see? If you want to see the glory of God, then all we better speak about is the glory of God. Amen. If we want to experience the power of God, then we better all we speak of the power of God. That's true. Amen. You ever hear the phrase, we are what we eat, well we are what we speak. Mm -hmm. If all you could ever speak is misery, then that's all you'll ever experience is misery. Sorry, it's the truth. It's not me, it's the Word of God. I'm just pointing it out. It's true. Let's all stand.